Now that we have a definition of the velocity that a sample of gas may have, let us now define what is the pressure that that sample of gas will exert on a container. The strategy that we will use to find that pressure is according to the four points that I have written here, where the first point is we will first find the change in momentum for one molecule hitting a wall. Then the second one will be we will find the time between each collision with that wall. The reason we're going to find those two quantities is that so we can determine the force that each molecule generates and the force is calculated by the change in momentum over the change in time. And then once we've determined that force, then what we're going to do is then find the pressure by dividing that force by the area of that wall. So based on these four points, we're going to determine what is the pressure of a gas according to the kinetic model of gases. So let's calculate the first point. The first point is we're going to find the change in momentum for one molecule hitting a wall. In this case, to simplify matters, we're going to operate in one dimension. So let's pretend I have a cavity that is of length L, and I have some particle traveling with speed Vx, in this case initially heading to the left. And what it's going to do is it's going to strike this far left wall. When it hits that wall, it's going to rebound elastically, since according to the kinetic model of gases, all collisions are elastic, meaning that no energy is lost. So when it strikes that wall, at speed vx it's going to rebound where it's going to travel to the right then with speed vx. What that means is that my change in momentum is just going to be the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Well the final momentum is just going to be m times vx since vx is now moving to the right and from that I'm going to subtract off m times negative vx. And so what that leaves me in the end is that a change in momentum is going to be equal to mvx minus minus vx, or in other words, 2mvx. Let's now determine number two. Let's find the time between each collisions with that one wall. So in this case, we're still looking at our one-dimensional cavity with length L, since we're still looking at the case that we just had above. Let's pretend that we have the case where the particle has just struck the wall and it has just rebounded. So it's now traveling to the right with speed vx. Now the time it takes for it to come back and strike this left wall again is essentially determined by this speed vx. And so it has to travel all the way to the one end, so it has to travel a length l, and then it's going to travel all the way back again, that same length l. And so what I can write for an equation is that I can say, well, the speed vx, well, that's going to be equal to 2 times l divided by the time it takes for it to travel 2l, basically the time it takes to go from one end of the cavity all the way back to the beginning. And again, that's what's going to give me my speed vx. And so if I rewrite this, then I can calculate the difference in time it takes for it to travel in between those two walls or for basically to travel from the wall that it just struck all the way across the barrier and then all the way back again to be equal to 2 times L divided by its speed which again never changes because it always deals with elastic collisions. Alright, so now that we have the change in momentum due to one particle and we have the change in time or the difference of time it takes for it to strike the same wall again we can now determine the force that one molecule generates which is just again delta P divided by delta T. So I can just substitute in these two values that we just calculated, 2mvx divided by 2l divided by vx. So in this case, my 2's cancel out. My vx, which is on the bottom, becomes multiplied. So I get mvx squared divided by l. And so that is the force generated by 1 particle. Now of course a gas isn't just made out of one particle. A gas is actually made up of many particles put together. And so what we're going to do is define this now for n moles of gas. We're still going to do this in 1D for the time being. But there are two things that we're going to change. The first one is that the mass that we have here, when I have for one particle, we're going to rewrite that for n moles of gas. 
So the mass of the gas, which would be the value that I'd be plugging into there, well, what's that equal to is N, which is the number of moles of gas, times the molar mass of the gas. So M is the molar mass. The second piece of information that I'm going to substitute in is that this Vx squared, well, that's the velocity in one dimension, in this case, the x direction, of the one particle of gas. But of course, as we just saw in the previous slide, we know that there's a distribution of speeds that a sample of gases is going to have, and that's according to Maxwell. And so not all the gas particles are going to move at the same speed. So that means that what we need to do is that what we're going to take then is the average of the, of the squares of the speeds. We're going to take essentially, since the force is related on Vx squared, what we're going to do is we're going to take the average of Vx squared to then define then the average force that is exerted on that of the walls of our chamber. So if we put these two changes into the force expression that we have written above, what we'll get is then the force of a sample of gases is M, or sorry, N times capital M times the average of the squares of the speeds divided by L. And the thing again that I want to stress is that the average of the squares of the speeds is not equal to the average of the speeds squared. These are two different quantities. And again, I'm just reiterating that the value that I'm writing in here is that we're taking the average of the squares of the speeds because when we talked about one particle, it was the square of that speed. And then now when we talk about an ensemble of particles, we have to take the average of that quantity. And so the average of that quantity is the average of the squares of the speeds. So now let's extrapolate this to three dimensions. The one thing that we can say is that since the random or the motion of the particles in three dimensions and in one dimension, it was still random, then that means then that if I were to say the average of any of the directions, and really it's that in any direction anyways, we could say that the average in any of the three Cartesian directions are going to be all the same. And this is because the motion of particles is random. The second thing that we can say, and this is according to Pythagoras, is that it's of course always easy to measure the total speed than it is to measure any one component of the speed. And that according to Pythagoras, I can also write that the average of the square of the speed is equal to the summation of each of the components. And so with these two expressions, what I can end up writing then is that the total speed, the average of the speed squared, in this case is equal to three times any one of the components. And that's just because these three components are all the same. And so really I've got the same component plus the same component plus the same component, which gives me three times any one of the components. And I'm choosing to write it as Vx simply because in my expression before, I have Vx. I have the x component written in. And so what that means is that I can take that expression for force, and since here I have it written in one dimension, now I can write it in three dimensions. And so really I can write the force is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass of the gas times the average of the speed squared divided by 3 times L. And all I did there is I just took this 3 and just moved it to the other side. I divided both sides by 3. And that's why the 3 is on the bottom. And that's how I get a measurement of force in three dimensions. Now this quantity, the average of the velocity squared, this actually has a special name. What I can call this instead is, I can call it the root mean squared. And in this case, since I'm talking about this, the average of this velocity squared, then it's the root mean squared 
squared. And so the actual absolute definition is VRMS is equal to the square root of the average of the velocity squared. And that's what gives me the root, meaning the square root, the mean being the mean of the value, and the squared, meaning that it's the square of the velocity. And so when I rewrite this expression, then I can rewrite it as the force is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass times the root mean squared squared divided by 3L. So that finishes point number three, which is determine the force. And in this case, again, we have that in three dimensions now.